And so on the same day that Christ rose from the dead, the disciples were gathered. Now, they were gathered minus Thomas. We don't know where Thomas was at, but he was not in the, in the, in the meeting. But as we noted, that when Jesus was crucified and during the sham of a trial, that they scattered for fear. Now, they scattered for fear. I think that they scattered for fear because I believe that they were scared that maybe they were going to be crucified also. Because we know that when Peter denied Christ three times, three different people said that they knew him, that he was part of those that followed Jesus. And so they scattered, they were scattered, but yet now they are together in one room, minus, of course, Judas and Thomas. And so, and it says right here, if we look, it says, in the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews. It says the doors were shut. You know what that means? They locked themselves in. You ever had, uh, you ever had to do that, have to lock yourself in because you were afraid of something or someone? I, you know, I myself have not locked myself in because of fear. I've locked myself in a room because I was playing hide and seek and I didn't want anybody to find me, you know, uh, in the house or... You know, when I was younger, we played hide-and-seek in, in the church with the youth group, and, you know, I was always so small I could fit into the door where the air conditioners were. You know, and I could open it up, and I could fit right in there. Nobody ever find me because they look, and oh, it's just an air conditioner, and I could slip into the side of it. But, no, I, you know, I've never had to lock the door uh, in fear of no one finding me. Uh, you know, I may have done it when I was a kid because I didn't want to get a whooping from my dad. But, you know... They were shut. They shut the doors and they locked the doors so that no one could get in to where they were at because of the fear. When they shut, when they shut those doors, nobody could get in. What does Jesus do? As the fear of the Jews came, Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, "Peace be unto you." Now, you and I, if we were to show up at this, at this room, you and I wouldn't be able to get into it. But Jesus was able to get into it. Why was Jesus able to get into that room? He was in his glorified body. Think about this. The disciples were in there talking in fear, probably trying to figure out what they were going to do, right? Because... You know, they knew that Jesus had risen from the dead, but they didn't know where he was at at the moment. And they were kind of fearful of what was going to happen and probably trying to come up with a game plan. And then Jesus just shows up in the midst of his glorified body. Can you imagine the disciples got to see Jesus in his glorified body here on earth? And Jesus, the first thing he tells them is peace. Be with you, right? Peace. Now, Jesus knows his disciples. He knows what's going on. And the thing about Jesus is he always knows what to say when to say it. When we're dealing with things, Jesus knows exactly what we need. And so he knew that they were fearful of the Jews, and he comes in and he tells them to be peace. That peace be unto you. That peace, that word peace means peace tranquility. It means don't be afraid of it. The kind of peace we have when everything's going right. Right? That's what it is. This is the kind of peace it's talking about. Not the kind of peace that we have uh, when, uh, not, not the peace that we have with God, but the peace of tranquility, you know. I don't have to worry about anything. The kind of peace that you kind of want when you're on a cruise ship sitting and, and you know, nothing, you don't have to worry about anything. That's the kind of peace. He's talking about peace and tranquility. And so he says, you need to, he goes, peace be unto you. He's trying to let them know that they don't have anything to worry about. And, what is, and when, when they saw Jesus, the disciples, it says, and when, they had, and when he had said, or so said, he showed unto them, them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw Jesus the Lord. 
Have you ever had to be apart from someone for so a long period of time that when you see them, you're glad to see them? I, when I was a kid, my grandparents, you know, I, I lived in Texas and they lived in Oklahoma, and I got to I got to see them twice a year. Once was at Christmas, and once it was in the summertime when I would go up for a week or two, and I'd get to see them. And every summer when I got to see them, I was glad to see them. I was happy to see my 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 grandpa, right? You know, and and it says that they were glad to see him, and I and I, I'm sure my glad to see my grandpa didn't measure up to the glad that they were glad to see the Savior. You know, the the I I, I try to use my imagination. What probably happened? They probably jumped up and probably was happy to see him, and and maybe even a party going on inside the room. You know, of laughing and enjoying uh, Jesus being there, but. They were when they saw it when he said, "Look at my hands and look at my side," and he said, and "It says that they were glad to see him." And this just in, seeing the Savior should bring gladness. You know, I'm not big on the contemporary Christian music and the praise and worship music. I'm not big on that. But I remember when Mercy Me came out with that song. Uh, I can only imagine, right? And I remember when that song came out, and it, it floored me. I'm like, you know, I really never imagined what I would do when I sing. Never imagined. And I'm sitting there going, you know, in a song, it says, Will I sing hallelujah, or will my knees will I fall? You know, I thought about that for years. Well, what am I going to say? What am I going to do when I see my Savior? The thing is, is to a believer, it should be glad when we see our sin. But I think, unfortunately, there's going to be a lot of regret. Because when we're standing before the Bema seat, the judgment seat of Christ, and we're given account to what we did with our life that he gave us, I know there's going to be a lot of regret. But in a believer's life, there's not only may be gladness as there should be, but I think there's also going to be uh, a lot of sadness because, uh oh. And sometimes I, I find myself in that same boat. Yes, I'm going to be happy to see my Savior. You know, I want, you know, as they say, I want a bunch of jewels in my crown. Yeah, I want jewels in my crown. Why? So I can give it back to him. That's my whole thing is. Whatever jewels get it that I get in this crown, it's not for me to wear, it's for me to throw at his feet. But yes, I'm going to be happy to see my Savior, the one who bought and paid for me, who shed his blood for my, for, for my sins. Yes, I'm going to be glad to see him, and it, seeing him ought to bring gladness, but also I'm going to be, there's going to be disappointment in myself. It says that the disciples were glad to see him. Listen, that ought to, when we, when we leave this earth, whether it's by the rapture or the undertaker, when we see him, there ought to be gladness. Seeing the Savior, listen, what we go, what, the judgment seat of Christ is going to be nothing compared to the great life of the We don't, as a, as a believer, we don't have to face that. And that alone ought to bring gladness. But it says, they, it says when they saw him, they were glad. And once they saw him, and then Jesus said, Peace be unto you. As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. So Jesus comes back. And they're glad, and they have the first church service with his resurrected body. And you know, you know, and I noticed this. The first church service they have with his resurrected body, what does he do? He commissions them. He says, yeah, we, I'm glad you're glad that I'm here, but hey, you have a job to do now. He goes, peace be unto you. As my father has sent my, me, now I'm sending you. He's commissioning them right here and there in this room. This, this time of being afraid and, 
being gathered together and not doing anything, it's over. He says, I'm sending you out. He goes, but not only is he not, he's sending them out, he's about to enable them to be sent out. What's that very next verse say? What did he do? And he, says, and he goes, and when he said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Jesus just inspired the disciples. What do you mean? He inspired? Yeah, that's what it means. That's what inspiration means. God breathed. God, what did he do? He inspired them. He, got, he breathed on them and he said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. He just gave them the comforter which he, pro he has promised them. Now, before, well, Jesus was on earth in the ministry. Jesus did all the work. Now that he's about to leave, he's given them the gas so that they can do the work. And so he, he breathed on them, and he said, Receive ye the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. And then he says, Whatsoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them, and whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. Does this mean that the apostles can forgive sins? No. Nowhere in any of the, the writings that Paul or any of the disciples wrote does it say that they forgave sins. So what does it mean when Jesus says, whoever sins ye remit, they're remitted, and whosoever they, you say they retain, they retain. What does that mean? That means whoever receives the gospel, their sins are forgiven. And those who reject the gospel, their sins are returned. He says, I'm giving you the job to go out and to share the gospel. That's what he's saying. Because who you don't share, they don't have the opportunity to have their sins remitted. But their sins are retained. And those who reject, guess what? Their sins are retained also. He's saying, those who receive the gift of the gospel, who receive Christ, their, their, their sins are remitted because through the blood is the only way one's sins are remitted. Right? Without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sin. It's through the blood that one's sins are remitted. So, the apostle, so when Jesus is saying this, some people think, here you... Get Why would Jesus say that he they could remit the sins and have, and have people retain their sins? No, it's, it's it's that Jesus is telling them, I'm giving, you, I'm commissioning you to go out to preach the gospel, so they can have their sins remitted. And so we see here the commissioning of the church. Here. Not only that, we see. And eight days later, Jesus' second appearance with his disciples. Because remember, Thomas wasn't there. And we see here in verse 24, But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand and to his side, I will not believe. Thomas had absolutely everything he needed to put to believe that Jesus was there. He had every evidence needed to believe. All the, it wasn't just somebody, you know, saying that I, that one person is saying that they've seen Jesus. We're talking about the whole twelve, the, not twelve, no more the ten. Judas wasn't there. And Thomas wasn't there, so there's all ten of them said they've seen Jesus. Now, if Roy were to come in, or if Roy were to come in and say, "Hey, you know, I've seen Jesus," a red flag would be going off, saying, "Uh, well, Roy, let's 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 go see what's going on." Yes, let's check your medication. Listen, what it means to be to feed you? Did she feed you some 
uh, Little Caesars that was five, six days old. We know Brother Roy likes Little Caesars. No, he had everything he needed to believe. He said, nope. Not unless I myself can put my finger into his hands and feel the prints of the nails, and I can thrust my hand into his side and feel, I'm not going to believe. Now that is sad. You know, it is a sad state that when you, when you share the Gospels, when you get through the whole, whether it's a Roman road or whatever it is that you use, in the Bible to share the gospel, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ, and then someone still will not believe. And this is Thomas. He says, you know what? I'm not going to believe until I see it. Because we know Thomas is a doubter, right? Remember Thomas when they said when Jesus said he's going to go back to Jerusalem? Well, let's all go to Jerusalem. We'll just die with him. That's, just, that's Thomas. Why he has that nickname, Doubting Thomas, right? And so, Jesus' second appearance, we see in verse 25, and it says, the, uh, uh, verse 26, and then after eight days, again, his disciples were with him, and Thomas with him. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Now, Jesus had already commissioned them, and what are they doing? We're back in the room. But I think Thomas is like, you know what? They said, they said, I'm not leaving them again. I'm staying right here with them because if he shows up, I want to see. And so Thomas is with them in the room. And it says that they were in there within, which means the doors were locked again. And Jesus just shows up in the again and tells them to the peace, peace be unto you. Not only that, then what does he say to Thomas? Look. Here's my hand. Put your finger in. Here's my side. Put your hand in me. See that I am who I say I am. Look, at, look in there. Do you see where Thomas felt his hand or put his hand in the side? Jesus showed up and said, Here I am, Thomas. And what does Thomas say? My Lord and my God. Thomas, a doubter, says, My Lord, my God, a Jew. This is the whole climax of a Jew right here. If they were to say to Jesus. That's, that's the talk right there for a Jew to say. And he says that my Lord, my God. But it took Jesus being there for him to be to say, my Lord, my God. And Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou believe, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus is saying that this those disciples in the Thomas hate. There's gonna blessed are they that believe without seeing. Why? Because believing in him we do see. I'm not saying we're gonna see his physical body, we see him in everything. We can see his handiwork. See, Thomas has, and these disciples have a testimony, a testimony like no other because they've seen Jesus. And then John here the end of verse chapter 20, he states the reason why he wrote this book. It says, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, 
which are not written in this book. Some authors say that they believe that John wrote this because they saw more miracles and more things that Jesus did after the resurrection. And he says, but these are written. He said, the reason, the miracles that are written in this is for one reason, that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through him. See, each writer in the Gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all wrote with a specific purpose. John wrote, if John's the easiest Gospel to read. See, John wasn't trying to fill in the gaps from the other Gospels. He wasn't trying to write a biography of Jesus, what Jesus did. His, his biography didn't write his life story. John had one purpose in writing the book of John. It is that the world can see through this book, when they read this book, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And that reading that, that they might believe, that they might have life. That was his whole purpose of writing get this account of the gospel of God. And every, and every single disciple, the apostle Paul, all of them had a reason to share the gospel. But so that others might go. Paul was no different than than uh, these other disciples other than the fact that he didn't have the, as many years with Jesus as, he, uh, as they did. But John, it, it's, so, uh, it's difficult for me to believe that somebody can't read the book of John and not realize that Jesus is the Savior. Jesus, I mean, we have in John chapter 3, with Nicodemus, a Pharisee, part of the Sanhedrin Council. And Jesus blatantly tells him that he's God. John chapter 3, verse 13, 3, 14. John chapter 3, verse 14. John wrote so that everyone might believe. You know, we've almost finished the book of John. We have one more time. And it's amazing to me, as soon as this is over, that Peter goes, I'm going to see. After all this, seeing Jesus' resurrected body, he goes, I'm going to had the comforter, they had everything that they needed. And Peter is the leader here in chapter 21. So he takes other people with him. And Jesus has, in chapter 21, Jesus has to sit in there and talk to him. The meeting that the disciples had with Jesus and seeing the resurrected was a miraculous thing. People say, you know, if I could just see Jesus, I would believe. No, you wouldn't. Because you would find Paul. That's not really true. I know there are people that say that. If I could just see Jesus, then I would believe. Or if I could just see this, I would believe. No. I don't believe you. Why? Because seeing is not believing, it's believing. Listen to this. Jesus has, a, the, as he commissioned the church, there were the disciples. It's the first church service with the disciples. He's commissioned us all. 
he tells him, As the Father has sent me, even so send I you. That commission didn't stop with his son. It continued with us as the gospel of God's church. And we ought to take that commission seriously. Listen, our country is, is splitting at the seams. And it's only by the grace of God that we as a country are still surviving. And the only thing that is going to heal this country is a turning back to God. That's the only thing. But how can the country heal? Believers are willing to go. If we're not willing to be the doctors and the nurses to go out and to do the work, how can a country be We can complain, we can listen to all the political rhetoric on the radio stations or, or uh, in TV shows. Today, when I was at the at the car leadership on, they had the, uh, the God-forsaken view. I'm sitting there, and there's, there's this woman watching, I'm like, man, I want to put on you, so you can blast it. See, be rude because of that. We can listen to all that. We can have all the political debates we want. The policies in our government is not what we feel doesn't matter what laws or policies that the, our elected officials or representatives or so-called representatives have. It will never do what Christ is. Christ is the only thing that can do. But we have got to be willing to do that. See, listen. Hospitals, that's a business. Our the healthcare system here in America, that is a money-making machine. That is a business. The church is not a business. As in a money-making, the church is a machine. Now, I'm not talking about TV and TV. I'm talking about Jesus. We're not in it for the money. We're in it for the money. We're in it for the money. Floods or people are going in to the hospital because they have health issues. Folks aren't coming to church because they care. They don't think they have a problem. It's our job to go out and to share with them. This is the office. But I know the great physician who can heal whatever it is that they're going May I introduce you? Father, as we conclude tonight and close, Lord, we all need to take this serious, the commissioning of the church, of us going out, sharing the gospel. Father, if there's someone watching live stream on Facebook or watching uh, archive, or if there's someone or in this building, or if they're not 100% sure if they were to die today, have would be their home. Father, I pray that they would get this done. Lord, if they would contact us, they're watching or they're in the room here, they would come forward and ask us to show us how they can know that if they were to die today, how would they be with them? Father, for you are the great physician of whatever their ail whatever they are, whether they have a family problem or health problems or financial problems, whatever it may be, you are the only one. Have your will and your way in the invitation. But for Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand. As the music begins to play, the altars are open.